What up YouTube, TK here, and today I come to you from this desk to tell you the story of the Grav A built in Adelaide. Now this is the first ever commercial product I developed and launched and sold. I moved a few units of these, uh, not a huge amount, but enough to enjoy myself. And I'm gonna tell you how it came about. Now, back a long, long time ago, I was a student and I liked playing guitar just about as much as I loved being an engineer. So I decided that when I finished my degree, I wanted to be in a band. However, I wanted to commit my life to this for a period of time and generally enjoy myself. But I also knew that if I did that for too long after graduating, it would be very, very difficult to get a job at all. I decided to keep my engineering skills fresh. I would develop and sell guitar pedals and other music electronics. So I founded a company called GravCorp and developed the Grav A. Now the Grav A was never intended to be my first commercial product. I was actually working on a digital guitar pedal called the Grav B. However, that never came to fruition because there were far too many things already in the market like it, such as the Geiger counter pedal, which is in itself very cool. Now, the story of the Grave really begins when I was actually quite young. I just started university and I joined a band. We played some shows and obviously I saw a lot of bands with a lot more guitar pedals than I had. I also saw that I could not afford these even slightly. So I did the same thing as everyone else who plays guitar and soldering iron. I decided to make my own pedal. I searched all over the internet, read about different distortion pedals you could build and different kits. And then I came across this one site about how to roll your own distortion pedal. And I decided I was gonna build an op amp gain stage with lots of different clipping options because I didn't really understand back then about good tone. I just figured having a pedal with as many different sounds in it as possible would be the most exciting thing. And so I built something that looked nothing like our beautiful Grav A here. It was basically a Hammond box covered in crap. Just hand drilled, raw metal finish, LEDs, diodes, switches, wires going everywhere, and it was awful. It basically didn't work for anything more than a couple seconds at a time. I had issues with grounding, I had issues with the op amp going into oscillation. It was just really frustrating, and I didn't understand enough about how it all worked to fix it. So, fast forward a couple years, and I'm looking for a way to maintain an engineering career while being in a band for a while and living the young lifestyle. I decided to go back to my roots. My digital pedal isn't going anywhere, so I decided to focus on the Grav A. So let's take a look inside and talk about the development. I basically went back to the same page and did what I could to understand more about how op amps and transistors and gain stages work. And I decided to start again, fresh sheet, although I was pretty much going to do the same thing. I wanted to do an op amp gain stage with different clipping options because you know, you can build a clone of a Tube Screamer, you can build a clone of a DS1, God, why would you? But, you know, why wouldn't you just buy a Tube Screamer? Why wouldn't you buy one of the other million clones out there? I wanted to do something a bit original. So I picked a strange op amp and I started building. And for the first time, I decided to take things a little bit beyond breadboards and perf boards because that was one thing that gave me so many issues. When you're trying to do something like a high gain audio circuit, you get issues when you work on a breadboard because of all these stray capacitances and everything's acting as an antenna. It gets very hard to work with and actually get any idea of what your final product will be like. So I instead skipped that, skipped the perf board stage and I made a PCB, a purple PCB from Osh Park. Now this is not that PCB, this is the revision two. Because you see, after I built the revision one, I liked it. However, it did have some issues. I took it to a friend of mine who is an accomplished guitarist and we played around with it for a day with his actual Fender Stratocaster and his actual Fender Blues Amp. It was fun. It had lots of different options. We had different clipping modes, which we both enjoyed a lot and it gave the pedal lots of different characters. But the problem was the tone stack was all wrong. The pedal sounded very tinny. We were losing a lot of mid range, a lot of bottom end. And just generally, it didn't sound warm enough. So I took things a step further. I added another transistor stage 
after the tone controls. Now, if you don't know a lot about guitar pedals, this might all be confusing. So let me break it down for you how this works. Basically, the way it works is signal comes into the guitar pedal here through this delicious 6.5 millimeter jack. It then heads along to this op amp. Now the op amp is a gain stage controlled by the lovely gain knob here. This gain knob is in the feedback loop of the op amp and by changing the resistance of the pot by turning it, you can change how much gain the op amp is giving you. If you wind it way up, you'll probably get a bit of feedback. You dial it down to something reasonable, sounds pretty good. Now also hanging off the gain stage are some diodes connected to this switch. In the center position, the diodes are disconnected the gain basically controls how loud the signal gets and you can use it to overdrive your valve amp into distortion. Very good. However, sometimes you want the pedal to create some distortion of its own. You can flip it into one of these two modes, top or bottom, and that switches some diodes into the circuit. What those diodes do is they take the AC waveform and they basically clip it to ground and make it all fuzzy and delicious and sound amazing and aggressive and sometimes painful. Those are selectable, the different clipping modes with this switch. I'll talk more about that later. After the gain stage and the clipping diodes, it then travels to the tone stack. Now, the tone stack in this is similar to that in a big muff. It's a big pile of resistors and capacitors making a variable filter for the frequencies coming out of the guitar. By changing the tone knob, you can say, oh, I want more high end, I want more low end. Very good. Now, if you copy the big muff tone stack verbatim, it does have a rather interesting frequency response, which is a bit scooped in the mids, and that's great. However, you may not want that all the time. So this body knob enables you to change the way the tone stack actually works. You can dial out that mid scoop if you want, or you can put heaps of it in. It's all up to you. The body knob basically controls the shape of the frequency curve of the tone stack, and then the tone knob actually moves where the cutoff is. I think that's a correct understanding. I could be wrong. I'll put the schematics up for you to analyze and abuse me over later. Now, as I said, after I built the first board, I jammed with a friend, we had to play with it, and we weren't quite happy with the way it was all working. So what I did from there was I went from the tone stack, and then after that, I threw in an extra little transistor. What this transistor does is it just gives a bit of a boost to the signal after the tone stack because the tone stack is passive. It's a bunch of resistors and capacitors and it actually attenuates the signal somewhat. It's nice to just give the signal a little boost after the tone stack to just make everything sound a bit more lively and brighter and that's what that little guy does. If I remember correctly, that is a BC547B I'm actually lying through my teeth. I didn't remember it all. I just read it off the transistor. But yes, that is a BC547B. That is an NPN transistor. After that transistor, we then go to the volume knob, which is a simple volume control. And that can set the total output level to whatever you want for your amplifier so you don't overload the input circuitry. Or so you do, if you want to do that. Then we have an LED down here, which goes, hey, the distortion pedal's on, or no, no, it's not on. Uh, so overall, it's a distortion pedal with a big muff style tone stack with a body control to change the shape of it with three different clipping modes. And yeah, that's, that's the basic audio side of things covered. As for the rest of it, now we start here with this big lovely switch. This is the foot switch. And what this does is allow you to switch all the audio equipment in this box out of the circuit. If you have the guitar pedal switched off, the signal comes in, travels to the switch, and then travels straight to the output. It doesn't go through any other transistors, any other resistors, capacitors, it literally goes to the switch and straight to the output. That's called a true bypass setup, and it's something people really demand in their boutique guitar pedals, which is what I was trying to make. When you switch it to the other position, the signal goes to the board. Now, the only way to do this with an LED fully independently with true, true, true bypass is with a 3PDT or a three pole double throw switch, which is what we have here. These are actually expensive and you'll find that if you're building your own guitar pedals, you wanna buy one of these in a one-off quantity in Australia, you're looking at $14, $15. When you're ordering them online in tens and twenties, 
you can get them for maybe four or five dollars each. Now this switch here, this is for the clipping dies, as I mentioned before. This was actually a tough one to find. This is a double pole, double throw switch with a center off position. And the thing about that is, I actually struggled to find one that I liked. I wanted one that I could mount to the board that had these six pins, and it took me forever and ever to actually find a source for this. Eventually, I found RS Components were selling these in small quantities, say, I think 10 was the minimum order. Other than that, I was looking at ordering a thousand from China, which was more than I would need. The reason I needed a dual pole dual throw switch is because I wanted that center off position where there are no diodes connected at all. However, in this position, which we call loop mode, we connect two diodes going to ground in opposite polarities to the feedback loop of the op amp. In this other position, which we call output mode, we tie two diodes again in opposing polarities to ground off the output of the op amp. Both of those modes give a different flavor and shape to the waveform, which gives you some really interesting tonal opportunities. The, it's basically three pedals in one. You have a clean boost in the center position that you can use to overdrive a valve amp. Loop mode gives you some really fuzzy aggressive stuff. And output mode gives you a more classic big muff style tone. Just a really good overdrive. I could have done some different clipping options just with a single pole single throw, but due to the way I wanted to do it with the center off position and having the two different actual areas where I was going to both the feedback loop and also the op amp output, I really didn't have the option of using a single pole switch and it was remarkably hard to find that part. That's all the electronics. Let's talk about some of the problems you will have when you try and launch a commercial product especially if, like me, you're coming from a point where you've gotten comfortable with the electronics and you think you can make something you can sell to people in quantity. It sounds simple. I've made one. Let's make a hundred. Let's make a thousand. It isn't that simple. First problem I had. These notes here. LM301 crossed out LF357. These are the op amps I tried. I first tried the LM301. I made this. Sounded pretty good. Then I went to Water 20 and I found out I couldn't get them anymore. I literally couldn't find them because they were end of life. So I switched instead to the LF357, put it in, played with a couple settings and it was great. You know, I was like, fine, I'm good. I needed to make more pedals. So I ordered a set of 20 LF357s off eBay. Mistake. These were not real parts. They were very, very fake. They looked the part. They actually looked really good. I put them in, soldered up a bunch of pedals and wondered why the pedals were screaming their heads off. They were oscillating like mad. I looked at the data sheet for the LF357, spoke to some very experienced electronic engineers that I know. On paper, my design should not be oscillating with an LF357. And the one I was holding in my hand G001 was not. This was not oscillating. And yet all the other pedals were. Eventually, I bought some from a different supplier. I realized the ones I bought off eBay were fake because when I got a real LF357 back in the circuit, everything was fine. So that, number one, is a problem you may have. You can make one of something and it works, and then when you go to source larger quantities of parts, you find out that your design falls apart. That was terrible. It gets worse, this case. Now, I spent at the time, what was big money to me, around about $400, $450 on a set of 10 cases shipped to Australia. That's the first problem. I live in Australia. It cost me big money to get cases shipped from overseas pedal suppliers with this custom artwork on them. When I got them, I had issues. You see, these four potentiometers are uh, set out on the board in a particular way and it was very easy to map that onto the front of the case. Yep, I want hole here, hole here, hole here, hole here. I know all the measurements between them. Bam, done. But then we come to the power supply and on the back here we have a DC barrel jack for powering the pedal and you can see it lines up very poorly with a hole that isn't even square or the right size. I was going for what Electro Harmonics achieved with their big muff pedals where the barrel jack slots nicely into the case and actually pops into place and sticks out perfectly. Unfortunately, I couldn't do that. The pedal case manufacturer I was using doesn't actually use engineering drawings. They don't use a template. They have a sort of rough template they use that they get you to fill out and then they ask you to send them a board. And so I sold it up a board, 
posted it over to them, which took two weeks because, again, didn't have a lot of money for express postage. They sent me back these and they didn't fit. The way this board locates in the case is through these four potentiometers here, which are bolted on like so, and the two input and output jacks on the sides. It was intended, as I said, that the barrel jack would pop in to the rear of the case. It didn't. I iterated on the board, tried to make things better, which took another month. And I already had customers waiting at this point and I was stressing out like mad. I went back and forth and there were a lot of angry emails to that supplier from them to me and from me to them. And things just didn't work. In the end, I got them to send me the cases and I had to come up with an idea to fix them. Now, if I worked for a big company where I actually had a workable development budget and I was a bit more experienced, I probably would have been able to figure out this issue and get them to pop out more nicely. However, I wasn't. What did I learn? Well, there is a very, very good workaround for barrel jacks on custom pedals. What I ended up doing was getting a big drill and drilling out the cases I had to make this round, around about a half inch. And I then simply purchased a round half inch jack. So at the end of the day, I had a whole bunch of issues at this point with the Rev2. It sounded great, especially with the extra gain stage, but I was burning time in assembly with all these added wires that I had to do to the switch. I had problems with this DC barrel jack that didn't fit in the case. And also, I just wasn't quite happy with the way it looked. It looked a little shabby, particularly with the way the knobs were overlaying a lot of the text, and it wasn't clear which label went with which control. So at this point, I decided to improve things with the Revision 3. Here we are looking at serial number 31. Now the first thing that was freaking me out was the barrel jack. Simply, I knew I couldn't ship something out at a reasonable price looking like this. I switched to a round barrel jack. When I got the Rev 3 cases, I also realized I couldn't actually get the nut on the back. So for production purposes, I would push these through, solder them up, and use epoxy to hold the jack in place. And that worked excellently. The other thing I did was switch suppliers because I had burned a bridge in both directions dealing with the first one with this barrel jack issue. And I was more than happy to move. I switched to Mammoth Electronics who had a much more rigorous production process, a much better template for producing their cases. And I was a lot more confident that when I gave them measurements for a case, that's what I'd get. So these cases look a lot better and you can see that it's much clearer that this is the tone knob, this is the body knob, this is volume and this is gain. Well, admittedly it's clear to me because I wrote it, but also the best thing is that the knobs don't cover up anywhere near as much of the graphics as they used to. You can also see this one says the grave, which I thought just neatly filled out this white space a little bit. Now the other major change to the grave at this point was moving the switch. All this wiring down here has to be done point to point and all these wires have to be hand stripped. It takes a very long time. So to save time in assembly, I moved the switch onto the printed circuit board. The only problem is, and this actually affects both revisions, is that in shipping, occasionally these switches break. But it was much quicker to assemble moving it onto the PCB, and you can see it soldered in here. While these switches weren't designed for mounting on a board, I actually just got around it by having very large holes and very large solder pads, and it works great. I also moved the resistor for the LED onto the board to again speed up assembly rather than having it dangling in free space. I also switched to a different supplier of PCB, switching to ITED Studio. Osh Park are great, but ITED were able to do me a much better deal on the quantities I was ordering, so I went to them. All these little changes might not sound like much, but they did make it much easier to build this, and you can see just inside how much cleaner it looks. And also I have way less little bodges on the board from mistakes I made in the initial design. And plus, you can't argue and tell me that that isn't the cutest little electrolytic capacitor you've ever seen. Overall, I was much, much happier with this design. I could produce something reliably without having to drill holes in the sides where the original company got them wrong. It meant I didn't have to patch things up with automotive repair paint and try and polish them back to a saleable condition. I was getting cases in, boards in, everything fit, and I could assemble these quickly enough that I wasn't crying myself to sleep over how much money I was losing. Now, one thing you may not realize when you go to make things for other people is that, you know, if you're building it for yourself, you don't really even notice a couple of scratches and nicks and bumps here and there. When you are shipping these to people who have paid good money for a new product, 
you can't ship the thing with a huge gash across it. So I had to be very careful to get assembly right the first time because every time you go and take this apart to rework it, you risk scratching the case, making a mark somewhere. And at that point, if you ship this to somebody for the price of a new pedal, they're going to be furious. You know, like I, I paid good money for this and it looks used. And that's a big thing I didn't realize going in. It's incredibly difficult to make things by hand to a saleable standard. It's so easy to just drop it, knock it, touch it with a soldering iron on the paint and ruin a case that's worth 10 to $20 by the time you're done with shipping. You have to be incredibly careful during assembly and you have to set up your workspace to utterly minimize any kind of damage to the cases. I used to work on the foam that these shipped in. I would put that down and I would put the cases on there while I was working on them so they wouldn't get bumped on the table. I kid you not, I probably broke or damaged or dented five or six cases and that was a big loss. Those, those were pedals I could no longer sell. I put a couple up on eBay as factory seconds for a much reduced price, but you know, at that point it wasn't even really worth building them. So it was very tough for me at that time. Now, in terms of figuring out how you would build your own pedal design, I did a lot of research and I took a lot of inspiration from the big muffs from EHX or Electro Harmonics. They lock the board in the case using the sockets and using the potentiometers. By searching very hard, I found websites that specially supplied parts for guitar pedals, which included these case mount sockets and these case mount potentiometers. If you're just shopping around your local parts store like Radio Shack, but obviously none of those exist anymore, you're not going to find the right PCB mount pots that actually work in these applications for case mounting. You can end up with a situation where you have to hand wire every pot to the board like I have with this switch. It gets very messy very quickly and wastes a lot of time during assembly. Just seeing me disassemble this, you're probably getting an idea of how long it takes to assemble each one. If your brand name isn't big and you're not selling an interesting pedal, or even if you are, it can be very difficult to justify the assembly time in the cost that you can actually sell these for. And that's a bit of a problem. Boutique pedals are a really hard industry to make serious money in partially because there are so damn many. And you can see what a headache I'm having doing this and why it is utterly important that you get your assembly right first time. Any rework absolutely kills your product margin. Not even kidding. There we go. Here you can see not only the connectors, but also the pots. Now these come out at a 90 degree angle. I measured these all very carefully before I got boards made and line them up with the holes. I knew that there was say, uh, I think it's 10 millimeters down and 20 millimeters across between each pot. And that allowed me to map to the case perfectly. Once I'd made the first revision of cases, I then improved things slightly going in the second revision, added the switch and moved the graphics around to make it all look nicer. We have the op amp up the top here and all the passive components are mounted either horizontally or vertically. It looks really nice and it made putting it together fairly easy. There's not a whole lot of need on a board like this, which is a double layer to orient things at any weird angles. It just looks tidier having everything vertical or horizontal. As far as soldering goes with these, it was all done by me by hand. I did aim to scrape off some of the larger chunks of flux and that was mostly for looks, but you can see there is still some here and there. The vast majority of people aren't gonna open these. However, when I was putting these up for sale, people wanna know that if they're buying a boutique pedal from an unknown builder, they wanna know that it's not just a mess of wires inside like this thing which I built for somebody quite a long time ago. They wanna know they're getting a quality product. By showing them the internals and when they look as neat as this, you give them some peace of mind. But overall, inside, it's not a complex machine. Things you have to watch out for that you might not initially realize when you're working on one-offs is that when you change capacitors, you may get some that are short and you may get some that are longer. I actually dealt with two or three different sizes of these capacitors even though they were all the same value. It depended on who I bought from, what size the actual case was. For little home projects, you never think about these things, but when you're going into production, that can be the difference between, for example, your power socket fitting and not fitting. You've got to be really careful when you go into series production of something that you get these things right and 
your parts don't change or if they do you can manage the risks but overall this was the final revision of the grave it looks neat and tidy inside it has a power jack that actually sits on the outside of the case properly doesn't look perfect obviously dead center would always be nicer but it did the job for my customers and i did always want to go with a pink led but i never got the chance or actually more accurately i couldn't source pink leds in the small size that i wanted that i thought was aesthetically pleasing instead i went with an orange nice burnt orange which was pretty cool in and of itself so by testing and iterating on the original prototype, which I don't have here, I was able to get to the revision too. And this thing sounded great. It was all about getting it in the hands of different guitarists, listening to their feedback, playing with it myself, and just trying to find what a great tone is and, and making a pedal that didn't just make lots of different tones, but actually made a whole bunch of good ones. From there, from the revision two to the revision three, it was all about production engineering, making these little changes like with the switch, like with the DC barrel jack, that meant I could produce them quicker and thus make more profit because I was spending less time actually building them. Plus, I came up with a product that I was actually rather proud of. Um, I've actually shown this in multiple job interviews and well, every job interview I have shown this in, I've gotten, which has been pretty fantastic. And so in the end, the plan worked. I spent two years playing with a band and two years working on pedals and selling them to people. And I had an absolutely fantastic time and I still got an engineering job afterwards. By creating something and keeping my hands busy and teaching myself a whole bunch about not only electronics, but production of consumer goods, I had a fantastic time and I learned a hell of a lot doing so. What I haven't really covered today is all the other bits of running this pedal business. Things like dealing with shipping, with overseas suppliers, a whole bunch of stuff that is far beyond the scope of what goes into the Grave A. But that I will save for another video. I hope I've given you an idea of what it takes to go from a filthy little prototype like this which is albeit a different pedal, to a shiny commercial product that you can actually sell in a store. Overall though, I hope you found this useful and interesting and are inspired to make your own electronics for fun and or profit. If you dug it, go ahead and like and subscribe. Until next time, TK out.